Hello, and welcome to Talk of the Town. I'm your host, Kathy Healy, along with my co-host, Emmy Macri. On today's show, we're going to be talking about everything you need to know about college admissions and more. With us in the studio today are Senior Assistant Director of Admissions from Merrimack College, Christine Carroll. We also have Senior Assistant Director of Admissions at Boston College, Cindy Cordova. And we have Director of Admissions from Bentley University, Mario Silva Rosa. And we have a Director of Admissions from Boston University, John McEachran. First, I want to say thank you for being on the show and thank you for coming here. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to the show. So as a high school guidance counselor, I'm well aware of all of the information that students must give you in order to get accepted to your schools. What, in your opinion, is the most important factor in admissions? Christine, why don't we start with you? Yeah, um, it's hard to say there's one important factor because it, it really is a collection. Um, but I really think you know schools are looking for a a student who is ready for college, whether that be academically and even you know socially and emotionally, uh, but also a student who's really going to contribute to their school. So whether that's with activities, with hopefully being, you know, a involved alum, you know, throughout the year. So, you know, really looking for things that that make a student stand out in kind of those two areas. So I know for Merrimack, it's hard to point on one, but kind of that whole picture of, again, what makes them both ready for college, but also um, a strong contributor to the campus. Oh, thank you. Cindy? Yeah, I would agree. We practice a holistic review process, so meaning that we're looking at the students as a whole person. And I think from that, we're thinking about the students who are going to do well in the classroom, but who are also going to get involved and be engaged. And that really comes from everything, uh, from their extracurricular activities, their statements and essays, their passions, but also to see how it is that they're taking advantage of a curriculum that will challenge them in high school, that will help prepare them for the next step. Um, so all of it combined really helps us think about the student that we're gonna be um, welcoming to Boston College. Awesome, great. Mario? I think that um, in addition to what has been said already, I think it's important for us to pay close attention to uh, all, the, uh, all the material that the student will provide to us. But at the core, uh, we like to answer kind of like a key, key question you know, are they intellectually curious? Are they motivated uh, to come in and not only take full advantage of the curriculum that we have available, but at the same time, uh, are they gonna thrive and uh, contribute to, to the com community? So certainly right. that's kind of like at the core of uh, an evaluation. Right, and John, how about you? And I couldn't agree more with what the, my colleagues have said. And I, the only thing I would add is context is incredibly important, you know, because a, a curriculum with no context isn't that helpful to us in the review process what what activities are available to a student you know, what is the home life like those types of pieces of of contextual information add a texture to help us make those decisions about how prepared students will be to to come to our campuses great thank you so the next topic i want to talk about is early action versus early decision and for those of you viewers who don't know what that means early action is when a student applies early most likely in november or december and doesn't have to give the college an answer until May 1st, where early decision is binding. That means they can only apply to one school early decision because if they get accepted there, they do have to attend that college. So I just wanted to get your input on early action versus early decision. Who should apply early action, early decision? Do you have to really meet or exceed their GPA or admission requirements before you do that? Or what type of student would you suggest do that? Um, yeah, so I think a student who is a great option for early decision is a student who truly that is the school that they want to be at, and it's also very feasible for them to attend. So financially also, that's something for students to keep in mind. Um, many students will hear their decision back before they get their financial aid package, and we would hate to have a student be in a tough spot where they're really excited for the school, they want to come, but financially maybe it's not a great fit. Um, so if a student really believes that they are a great fit for the school, this is their place, uh, and they're ready to make that commitment, um, I think that's a great fit for a student. 
Um, if they're just trying to game the system and thinking that's going to give them better odds, um, that's really not who early decision is intended for because it might not give them the results that they're they're looking for. Right. Is that the same across the board? Lisa? Across the board. It's our first year with Boston College having early decision one and two. So we're really excited. We get to learn from the students who are going to be applying this year. Um, but I would echo everything that was just said in terms of the fit, you know, thinking about if the university is your top choice school and you don't see going, you don't see yourself going anywhere else. Yeah. It really requires having a conversation with the family, with the counselors at the school, thinking about you know whether the school is going to be a good fit. Every school here has its own identity, yeah. and so I think that when the students are looking at you know that fit question, they really do have to go through the website or connect with one of us so that way that we can get their questions answered, um, but also with financial assistance so that, that way they're thinking about the cost of the university as well. Um, and we all have different models um, in terms of financial aid. Um, so that's something also to consider. At BC, we practice need blind admissions okay. um, and we also meet full demonstrated need. So when we're thinking about those students who are going to be applying through early decision, um, there are some advantages, obviously, because they're applying to usually a smaller pool of applicants, and that's one of the advantages of early decision. Um, they also get to apply early and find out early. It's in its name, right? One of the advantages. Um, and they also get the same financial aid consideration, whether they were applying through early decision or regular decision. But it does come down to that question to see if the school is the right fit for them. And can you explain a little bit more in detail about need blind for those viewers who don't know yeah. what that means? Yeah, so need blind admissions basically means that in my office, um, as a reader, we're never going to be seeing your financial aid documents um, in order to make a decision of whether to admit you or not. So that's a separate office, the Office of Financial Assistance, and they take care of looking at need-based need um, documents such as FAFSA and the CSS profile, um, and basically they're putting together a financial aid package for you that's independent of, of our decision. Um, and the financial aid package could include grants, loans, or work study. Um, at BC, we are also one out of 20 universities in the US that besides practicing need blight admissions, we also meet full demonstrated need. So we're looking at how can we zero, zero that gap between what the family can afford to send the student to college and the cost of Boston College. And we're helping the families by creating a package for them that will help prepare them for the next um, four years of their education at Boston College or however long it takes them to complete their degree at BC. Great. And for those of you who have early action, or early decision one and two, can you explain to the viewers the difference between what is the difference between early action one or early decision two or... I think a lot of people have a lot of confusion around that. Sure. At Boston University, we have two rounds of early decision, like at, at Boston College, where we'll have a November 1st deadline and then another deadline in early January, which corresponds with our regular decision deadline. And mm -hmm. really, the difference is the calendar and the timeline. Um, they both follow the same rules of engagement in terms of a counselor, uh, a parent or a guardian will sign off, as well as a student on the early decision agreement, which will say, yes, I'm committed to go to this institution if, if they admit me, mm -hmm. as Cindy explained. Um, we typically notify early decision round one students in early to mid-December, and then students will enroll at Boston University after that. The benefit of an early decision round two is say you have applied early action or early decision to another school and you've heard news that might not be as fortunate as you were hoping for, you might pivot to what would be then your very top choice. Uh, so it gives students who are either locally who might fall into that category or we have a fairly large international population at BU and over half of our early decision two applicants are coming from overseas that are on a different calendar. Oh, okay. Yeah, makes sense. Yes. Now, you had mentioned a school, each of you have a different I school identity. Mm -hmm. When you are, I hate to use the word quota because I don't think that that's the correct term I want, but when you are looking at students, are you trying to fill that, that quota for your identity so that your school has a certain balance or when you're going out and looking at uh, students? Sure, we, we don't have a quota. I think it's important for us to, as we are quote unquote shaping the class, uh, we are paying close attention to a lot of the details that we would like for that class to have perhaps characteristics that are uh, important for us. There is an infusion of uh, institutional um, demands or perhaps uh, uh, interests uh, within the process that are taken into account 
um, when we are shaping a class. So I think that uh, it's not technically a one size fits all type of process. Uh, we are seriously paying close attention and reading every single piece of information that comes through us. We have that luxury because of the size of the pool and the ability for us to to get through that to, to that process within the same calendar constraints that we that that are in place for higher ed. But uh, but at the same time, I think that we are we are paying close attention to the details within one particular class, and it's not necessarily that we mirror the same exact process that we took from the previous okay. year. I was just going, so, I was going to ask a follow-up yes. for, so that as you're looking uh, for each year, uh, there might be a different uh, flavor for that, that class. Exactly, it's very um, unique. And so that, it, say if there's a new program uh, developing at the university and they want to promote that, is that something you might be looking at? Okay, let's, let's concentrate and see if we can find a way to make this uh, fulfill this for the university? That's one of the hardest questions um, that, that we get every single year uh, because we don't know until we dive into the reading process or the file review process. So it's, uh, it's very hard to answer that question because we, we just don't know uh, what are the key markers of that particular pool of students that is applying on any given year until we dive into it. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. <laughs> Um, speaking of financial aid, like how do you guys um, can when once parents get the or students get their financial aid package, can they call financial aid at your college and negotiate at all? Is that a is that something that can be done? Or? So I you know we, we don't think of it so much as a negotiation, but we understand Sorry. that even with you know we we but that it's a good question because you know whether it's fulfilling the free application for federal student aid, the FAFSA, yeah. or the CSS profile at BU, we require them both, it doesn't answer all the questions. And so there are some things that come to light that we, our financial aid office, encourages students to follow up if there are things that might be missing, if there's some context that could be helpful. Okay. Um, so it's not a negotiation where a, a student could come in and say, well, at Bentley, I received X amount of money, match it. Okay. But it would be more like, here's some personal context that would be helpful for you to understand why this might be a bit of a reach for my family. Oh. And you know, with schools that guarantee to meet full need, that'd be one thing. There are other schools that might have flexibility with merit aid, and each school is gonna be different in how they approach that. Thank you. I think it's important to empower families to know the resources and the conversations that can happen before, during, and after they receive a decision. So before, for example, there are a couple of tools that families can use, such as the net price calculator, and that is available on the website for a lot of our universities. I think actually it's mandatory for um, universities to have that on their websites for financial aid. And so that way families can input the numbers for income and expenses and receive the estimated family contribution or EFC. Um, and with that information, at least they feel a little bit more knowledgeable and empowered to contact someone in the Office of Financial Assistance. Um, and get some of their individual questions answered, especially if they're thinking as a family that you know the student's going to apply through early decision. Um, you know you don't want to you don't want to go through the process feeling disempowered, um, and then certainly even after they get their decision, you know, some of the schools do offer the appeal process, but hopefully they're going into the process a little bit more informed um, and guarded with that information. I never felt more wealthy. <laughs> than when I filled out that FAFSA form. And they told me how much I was supposed to contribute to my I'm like, really? Yeah. I'm pretty sure I've got like a buck left at the end of the month. Not quite sure, okay. <laughs> but when you were talking about, again, I'm fascinated with the whole idea of, of balancing each class. I'm fascinated with that. And I know students come to me all the time when I'm like writing a college recommendation and how many activities they are, and how many, what the ac extra extracurricular activities that they do, whether it's sports, social, whatever it is. What, when you're looking at a student, are there characteristics of the extracurriculars that you're particularly looking for? Um, so that, and, and this is for me selfishly as I, write a college recommendation. Mm -hmm. Me too. I want to make sure I promote what yeah. you would like to know about, uh, and so that the students know, because I'm sure there are freshman parents right now uh, 
watching saying, oh, that's good to, for me to know. Maybe that will be information that's needed down the road. Right. In other words, you don't want us just to reiterate what's on the transcript or what's on the Common App, right? right. You want us to more tell a story maybe about the student? Is that, mm -hmm. does that yeah. make sense? I think it's, you know, I tell students when they have that extracurricular question, for us, it's not so much what you're doing, but that you're passionate and committed to something because we're hoping that then you'll take that passion and commitment and apply it to our campus. So whether you work, you know, a pretty full time, you know, right. commitment after school, you maybe you're uh, at a supervisor level at this point because you've been there or you do three sports and you're a team captain or maybe you're really involved in your local community, you know, outside of the school. Um, I tell students, I love to see it just because, you know, it's showing a commitment. You're you're doing something in addition. You're trying to maybe better a team or an area or, you know, help your family. Um, those are all really admirable qualities. And it's looking for that time management, that ability to be responsible, that ability to get involved and not want to just, you know, sit at home after school. And those are all characteristics, again, that we're hoping will be reflected on our campuses and that kind of going back to that, you know, being able to contribute to the campus and help continue to bring the campus to life. I think that's really important. And, you know, I'll have some students who say, I have major family responsibilities. I have siblings that I have to look after, or I have an, an ill family member. Right. And they think that that's somehow less than playing soccer, um, but it's not. And if anything, that's extremely admirable. And that shows empathy. And that shows, again, that responsibility to, you know, things that are important to you and that selflessness. Right. And, but I think sometimes students downplay that because they don't think it's a traditional extracurricular activity. Um, and those are where those letters can be really important because again, context, it really tells us what that student, who that student is, what's important to them and what they're committing their time to. Yes, I would echo the undermining thing because I've met with students as I've been traveling and, and, and talking to them about extracurricular activities. And I've had students come up to me and say, I don't do anything. And I'm like, wait a second, what have you done? <laughs> what were you doing for community service? I know your school requires for you to do community service to graduate from high school. And then they start thinking about that. And it's not only during the academic year, but also during the summer. I also talk to them about their family responsibilities. So we do see that some of them have to work after school or take care of someone oh, at home, yeah. um, you know, because they are the, the only person in the house at the time and they have to take care of younger siblings or a grandparent who's ill. All of that, they should definitely be including on the extracurricular activities page. There really isn't a magic formula of, or quantity of activities that I will be looking for. Would do you recommend to a student uh, to ask teachers who, as they say, can tell a story. Mm -hmm. I find it easier for me to write a recommendation about a student that I can tell a story about them, that I feel I know them well enough to, to tell that story and to say, this kid is awesome. You, they, you need to take them <laughs> because they're going to be fabulous at any school that they attend. And I, I want you to see that. But then I have students sometimes who ask me, I'm like, I, I don't really feel like I can tell a story about them. And that, that's like with me as a guidance counselor. Mm -hmm. I mean, teachers see the kids every day. We have frequent flyers, mm -hmm. um, but it's a lot harder. I do coach the tennis team where I know my tennis players really mm -hmm. well. Like mm -hmm. you would know your class uh, classes, but it is harder. And do, is there a difference when you look at a teacher recommendation versus a guidance counselor recommendation? I've always got a couple of pieces of advice for folks who are going into thinking about usually their junior year, the beginning of their senior, who's going to write that letter of recommendation. And the two pieces of advice I give are one, give your teacher an easy out. Because the, te the student who comes up to you and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to say. If you allow the teacher the flexibility to say, ah, oh, you know, I'm busy or I can't do it and you give them enough lead time, then you can continue to search for that teacher who's going to be enthusiastic to write that story. The other thing is, we, like you mentioned this, Kathy, before, we don't need teachers to corroborate a transcript. Yes. We have a transcript. Right. Right. You know, so that straight A student, what I'd rather see is what kind of characters are revealed to the mm -hmm. recommendation. Resilience. Do they know how to, do they have agency, self-advocacy? Do they know how to ask for help? Have they encountered a challenge? Because at all schools, once you go to college, you're gonna be encountering challenges that you've never had yes. before. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have the determination, the resilience to get through it, so where can we find that? Usually it is in the recommendations. And 
where they differ from what we're looking for from a teacher recommendation is we try to put our hat on as professors, even though we're not necessarily teaching classes, what I want the student in my classroom versus getting some of that more contextual information from the counselor who can speak to district concerns or if there are specific things about the community that a teacher wouldn't necessarily have in their narrow relationship, but have those broader Broader more thoughts. Yeah. Uh, more often than not, I um, when I'm interacting with students, uh, especially I have a very small territory, but I do have a territory. I think it keeps me uh, uh, sane and uh, <laughs> my, my uh, ear to the ground. But I try to talk to students about try to strategize around uh, the requests of uh, letters of recommendation, and um, I tell them start early, junior year, te technically. Those uh, teachers that you have had during the junior year tend to uh, be able to be the, uh, some of the best options for you. But at the same time, I also may uh, tell let, let them know that um, a, a great tip will be for them to consider um, those subjects that may not come easy to them, uh, that they've worked extremely hard to earn a, a, a great grade. Right. Could be an A, could be an A minus, B plus, whatever that may be, but that they really earn their grade and go after those teachers uh, for a letter of recommendation, they tend to be very telling um, uh, compared to your traditional boilerplate type of uh, letter of recommendation in which it's just validating uh, things that we already know. Um, so they, they, they tend to come out of uh, the comfort zone. Let's keep in mind, uh, once you get to that 100 letter of recommendation, they all start blurring and looking a lot like each other. So, you know, how can you make those letters resonate with the reader? And it could be a reader like me, been in the field for a very long time. It could be a reader um, that it's uh, uh, fairly new to the field, one, two, three years. That's a different... You're going to uh, see it with different eyes. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I tell the students, I mean, just just go after those subjects that you work extremely hard and and they tend to be very interesting letters of recommendation. Would it, oftentimes I'll have a student ask me who I, I had, I'm a freshman honors teacher. I had them as freshmen and they've gone on through the, the honors program and they'll say, could you write my letter of recommendation? And I can write, I can definitely write one because they struggled with me. Mine was the year that they struggled. But I worry, is that going to all of a sudden make it look bad because now they're trying to go into the field of mathematics and they didn't get their junior year teacher, even though I'm the one who can tell the story. I can tell the story of where they started. So I often say, you sure you don't want your junior teacher to write it versus me, your freshman teacher? So I, I'm not sure what would be the good recommendation for them, <laughs> yeah. even though I have an interesting story to write about them. I, I guess I would say it depends, right? Like everything in our field, <clears throat> when you ask questions, it depends. And um, it, it's going to depend on context. Now, Wakefield at school might be different than at another school where the student to teacher ratio is vastly different or the accessibility or the connection students might have. So I wouldn't want to say unequivocally it needs to be a junior year teacher or a sophomore year teacher because in some cases that connection, those teachers who had that type of experience might be the best for that student. Generally, we'd like to, you know, as we talked about rigor of curriculum and, and that being a, a good indicator for us about students who are going to succeed in our classrooms. I think we do want to see recommendations from, from teachers who have taught in some of the areas that might be more challenging or more representative of the work that they're going to do when they get to college. But again, it's not a blanket statement. And in some cases, especially for places that might request two letters of recommendation, that could be a great supplemental letter of recommendation okay. to show that element where they're getting an English teacher who's going to give a recommendation junior year. Okay. That's a great uh, segue to something that I was thinking about, it, and that is if the institution is requesting two letters of recommendation, submit two letters, not four, five, <laughs> six, seven. Uh, you'd be shocked uh, yeah. about how reckless uh, uh, an applicant could be. Uh, and that could be a turnoff. So yeah. that's a really <laughs> thank you. That's a really good piece exactly. of advice. Yes. You're welcome. We, we can tell <laughs> them it's a really good that. piece. And I would just add the conversation continues with the counselors even after everything is in. So even after the recommendation letters are in, um, I think that one thing that 
I love about my job. And I think, you know, many of us, as we travel, we get to connect with the counselors and we get to build this, the relationship with the counselor and the school. And so asking the representative, you know, can I call you if any updates mm -hmm. end up happening or if I need to you know, advocate uh, further for the student. And I think that it really depends on every institution um, and whether there are counselor calls that can happen within each cycle, right? So within early decision, early action, early decision two, regular decision, just so that we continue to learn from one another yes. and continue to get this feedback, yes. right? Like what helped you this year? Mm -hmm. How do I need to structure my, my letter of recommendation to make it easier for you to get through X number of applications right. that you're reading from the high school? Right. You know, when I'm looking at all of my students are applying, what stood out for, for you from these applicants and from my letter of recommendations. So it's an ongoing process. We're constantly learning from each other. That's great. When you're looking at students, I know I have a lot of student athletes. When you're looking at your um, athletes versus your academics, is there a different lens that you have to look? Are, are you given different directives to looking at certain pools of students? I mean, a student who is a great fit is going to be a great fit either way. Um, we do a lot of athletic pre-reads. So if a coach is thinking about an athlete, they will actually reach out to us with their materials, whether it's test scores, um, transcript, maybe other materials, and they'll say, hey, is this student a good fit? Should I'm pursuing this student. Should we keep pursuing them? Are they going to be eligible? Um, and so we try to get ahead of that conversation. Um, so a, a you know, coach isn't bringing somebody in who they're really excited about and we have reservations or vice versa. So we actually try to get ahead of that. And um, I think a lot of um, offices will have someone who works closely with athletics mm -hmm. to keep that conversation open. So we actually, sometimes even coaches will come to us with juniors and saying, hey, you know, we're, we're starting to, you know, work with this student. We're thinking about this student. Here's some grades. Here's what they're taking. Um, and, you know, what do you think? And so we can actually have that conversation oh, yeah. before the student even applies to see if they are going to be a good fit. Is that the same across the board? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, but it depends on the, the, the level. I mean, right. I, we have a couple of Division One, right. well, three Division One schools, and, and, and I work at a Division Two school. So uh, the focus might be a little bit different uh, based on um, where they are within the right. cycle and yes. uh, their goals athletically. Mm -hmm. So I mean, for us, we, we still do early reads, mm -hmm. and um, we have a great relationship with the athletic department. We do have an athletic liaison on our staff that works directly with the uh, athletic department to make sure that we provide enough feedback that will be helpful for them as they go through what they call the board of uh, recruits in, in different sports and, and try to uh, communicate and address the needs of uh, that particular team on our end and, and of the recruits on, on the other end. So, but it's totally different uh, compared to a Division One school. Yes, yeah, so and Merrimack College is Division One now. Just I like got to it. Yeah, mm -hmm. so just got Division now. One. Yeah. We're new to the so, party. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure thing. Ask me this question, you know, in a year or two from now. <laughs> and, and even Division One schools are going to vary considerably too. I mean, there are some leagues. So we're in the Patriot League. We have an academic index, and so all the students that we bring in that are recruited athletes need to fall into a certain band mm -hmm. within that index, which helps inform and gives parity throughout the league, so that one school in the league isn't going out and recruiting someone else and and that maybe another school might not not be comfortable admitting uh, but I think to, to even raise the conversation up a little bit it it's just one of the institutional priorities right there you know, Mario talked about institutional goals or things that we have to do athletics whether it's division one division two II, division three will factor into varying degrees but it's just one of the many elements that we're doing to try to to craft that class and how do legacies come into play like for your college like does that make a difference in admissions at all if a student's parent went there or yeah, for us, students are able to disclose on the application if they had a parent who graduated from Boston College. And we'll notate that, um, but at the same time, we need to make sure this is their process. We need to make sure they're able to um, keep up with the academics at Boston College, that they've been preparing themselves. And then also understanding from their essays, how is this your personal journey and why have you selected Boston College as the university where you want to be as a community, your home away from home? So I think it's definitely keeping that in mind, but also 
you know, the relationship that is there, we're very um, mindful of, you know, the fact that we are a community and many parents do end up coming back to campus or there are siblings or, you know, family members who have started their um, college career at Boston College. So we were very open to having conversations, obviously, with the families and guiding them along the way. But at the end of the day, you know, it's still the same process in terms of the review process and making sure that the students are reviewed holistically and that they have been preparing themselves academically speaking, and that the university is obviously a good fit for them. Is that the same for you guys? Yeah, I think that uh, uh, at the end of the, the day, when we are looking at uh, legacy um, students, I think it's important for us to discern um, what the level of affinity um, is within that particular student towards our institution. Are they truly driving um, the process or uh, is the the uh, uh, parent the parental? Yes, oh, parental right. um, <laughs> living vicariously. Uh, yes, that's right. Yes. Uh, so <laughs> that's a delicate balance, but at yeah. the same time, again, just uh, as it was has been said, we want to make sure that we don't set anyone for failure. So they will have to right. be scrutinized just like everyone else. Right. It's a, it's one indicator that's pulled together with others. And Cindy and Mario are saying it. it you, Generally, yes, if it's a, a legacy candidate, there there is a correlation to affinity and interest, and it's not always the case. Mm -hmm. But it's just one of the check marks as we go through the entire application to see how all those things add up. I know I was as I was looking at uh, some research that thinking of geographical uh, desirability, I noticed that there are some schools, like oh, oftentimes the big Midwestern, Notre Dame, that they actually, uh, the majority of their students come from a certain radius from their campus. And going into it deeper, it's more for the fact that they're going to have alumni who will come to their games because they are close. They'll be supporting the school because they're close. So when you're looking at geographical desirability, do you look at students who live farther away with a different lens as far as how will they be as an alumni if they're from far away? Or is it a benefit because they're far away and they can recruit for you in a new area that you might not have been able to recruit from. Good point. Yeah, I think this goes, goes back to what we were talking about earlier, Mario, a reference with institutional goals and um, thinking about the interests of the university and also the diversity of the university and the student body that we're bringing into campus so that they can learn from each other. Some of the students might have similar or different um, life experiences. And so maybe where they were coming from has shaped um, those experiences. So. I think it's important to note, you know, as you're thinking about shaping the class, where the students are coming from, um, how you're able to diversify the class in every single sense of the word, you know, whether it is through gender, um, demographics, um, where they're coming from, geographically speaking, um, what they're studying on campus, you know, and so and all of these other components that go into selecting a class. I particularly travel to Texas, so I have the entire state of Texas, wow. and I also have India, so oh, <laughs> wow. overseas, and I get to talk to them about Boston College, and I get to talk to them about this beautiful city that we live in um, and the surrounding areas. And so, you know, being able to, to see that they're interested in leaving their hometowns, I also have a high level of responsibility to help them understand the, the, the demographics of campus, you know, what they're looking for. Is it a good fit in terms of um, the different experiences or similar experiences? You know, so I think all of that is something that we also keep in mind um, as, as we're putting together the class. And it's exciting to be able to have, um, have so many of us you know, travel all over the United States and sometimes the world um, to be able to you know, go beyond the website, right? Or go beyond um, any other contact point and actually represent the university and, and can meet the students who are gonna be applying from different parts uh, of, of all over the world. Going back to the students' background, do you guys look at um, social media at all when you're selecting students? I stay away. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't actively. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes things come to our attention. Yeah. Oh. Um, and in that case, that's something that we take into account um, in that sense. Uh, you know, the same way a student 
you know, might have had something, you know, discipline that we have mm -hmm. to look at on their application. Mm -hmm. um, if we feel like we need to escalate that to someone else on our campus to say, hey, do we still think the student's a good fit? Are, is there going to be any potential harm, you know, um, on campus? So we don't actively seek it out. I don't need to know <laughs> okay. what they do in, in their personal That's lives. <laughs> um, but sometimes things do come to our attention. I think something students don't realize is when you email me through Gmail and you have like a picture in your Gmail, mm -hmm. it pops up yeah. and I've seen some interesting photos. So <laughs> that's something to keep in mind. Um, but we don't actively um, pursue it. Uh, okay. But if it does come to our attention somehow, um, unfortunately, we can't look away. Right. Is that the same for Bentley and BU? It is. There's a, you know, there's a record that goes with it, right? Like, you know, you, you start your social media account whenever you do, and that's history. And as long as it's there and it's public, I think students need to understand that. But no, we don't ask for handles or, or, or screen names or anything that we're going to go out and actively look. But we do have a responsibility if something is brought to our attention to, to look at that. And I think that that's something that's important to us as well. And generally, my advice to students is, you know, you want to behave in the social media form, media form, the same way we talk about asking students to behave with, you know, in, in just in face-to-face -face interactions, whether that's with empathy and kindness and graciousness and all of those things that we value, we would expect to also ex see in the social media space. Mm -hmm. so, so I think that the, um, this generation, Generation Z, uh, <laughs> that it's, it's coming into our shores, has grown up uh, digitally. Yes. Uh, that's the reality of it. But at the same time, I think that it's important, and, and I harp on this all the time when I interact with students, it's important to take a closer look at your social media footprint, so to speak, mm -hmm. um, and try to scrub as much as you can of those uh, compromising uh, things that you may or may not have uh, w within your accounts. And, and I say that because um, in reality, nothing is really private. And um, when we see some red flags in an applicant, uh, it, and, and, and it could be uh, actually some red flags in, in the application, we, we would take a closer look to see what's, what's out there. But on the contrary, we see some great stories on the application and we want to validate those stories. And we still go online and take a closer look, especially for an institution like ours. We, we have a lot of uh, buddy entrepreneurs uh, applying to our institution and they have done some great things uh, domestic and abroad and uh, we, we're going to pay close attention to it because we want to turn around and, and boast about those things. So it could work both ways. But I always tell the students just pay close attention to, to, to your footprint uh, online and, and, and try to put your best foot forward. Uh, even down to the email address that you share with us. I know. Yeah, some it of could them be off-putting at times. Oh my goodness, uh, I know. So, <laughs> so certainly uh, it's, but, but, I, but we do put things into context. This is the generation right. that has grown up online, oh, I know. Uh, pretty much so. And how important is demonstrated interest to all of you guys? So we don't track demonstrated interest at Boston College. Okay. Um, so, you know, we try to even it all out. Um, we just, if students have questions, they can find out who the person is that's gonna be reviewing their application and they can certainly re reach out with any questions. Um, but that's just our way of, of trying to keep that leveled out in case students are not able to visit campus or they're not able to um, you know, reach out one way or another. Are, do you not have interviews? We also don't hold interviews okay, as part of our review oh, process. Okay. So really through the essays, we get to know the students and their stories better. And then through a supplemental essay that is specific to Boston College, we ask them to pick one out of four questions. And all of the questions have to do with their values or values of the university, like the Jesuit ideals of Boston College and how, how is that a good fit for them? Um, what makes them come alive? How have they been able to do community service? Because community service is a big part of our student population and what they're doing on campus when they get there. Um, 
And so, you know, getting to the heart of service, but they get to pick one out of those four questions. And by doing so, they're showing us how much do you know about the university and, you know, how have you been able to do your individual research and self-reflection to think about whether Boston College is a good fit. So I always, always tell my students like that question, even though it's not directly asking you about Boston College, is for us to see how much you know about Boston College. And, you know, it's good for you to input that information based on the research that you've been able to do. And you can always reach out to us and ask us questions. And on Merrimack, we're on the opposite end of that coin, Mm -hmm. where demonstrated interest is something we track and we look actually quite heavily at. Um, I've definitely seen it push a student on, you know, on the over the edge in in a good way. Um, And especially when it's I'm getting to know them through that process. It's it's hard. We do read a lot of applications. And unfortunately, we're only able to connect um, with students, uh, so many students. But if you are coming to campus, if you're coming to open house, if when we visit your high school, you come by, or even for those students who are further away, maybe you send us, you know, an email or we set up, I've done, you know, Skype and FaceTime interviews. Um, there's a lot of ways to show interest. And for us, that's something that we do take into account. And uh, especially when I'm advocating for a student, who I really see that potential in, that fit, I think they could be great, and I really wanna push for, for their uh, admission, I can use that too, uh, to continue to bolster um, you know, my advocacy for them. Great, what about? And the only thing I, I would add to that is coming back to this notion of context, mm-hmm. and it's incredibly important because you, know, you, you could weigh heavily those students who are able to come visit you when you go to their, their neighborhoods, but we're only able to go to so many places, or mm-hmm. those who are able to come to campus, and with the applicant pool from over 160 countries, how realistic is it that students from specific right. backgrounds are yeah. able to make it to campus? Mm-hmm. So we can't hold students to un, uh, unrealistic expectations, but I think, as Cindy mentioned, there are opportunities, and many schools do have supplemental essays or other opportunities to demonstrate some kind of connection to the place. Um, it's going to come through in a multiple in multiple ways. Um, it's not necessarily just a visit or just an email to a representative that they may or may not know. It's really the entire application and understanding that a student who's been coached through the process versus a student who doesn't have that same resource available. So we try to take that all into consideration before just assigning a weight to this notion of demonstrated interest. I'm going to ask the nitty gritty question. Mm -hmm. (laughs) SATs, ACTs, what, how important, how not important? What's the scoop? Please tell me. (laughs) Merrimack's test optional. Um, Yes, without, with the exception of nursing now. So Mm -hmm. for us, they play almost no role for the most part. If, you know, with the exception of nursing, um, nine times out of 10, I'm not even looking for scores. Um, We've truly moved to that test optional model and also financially, they don't play any role. So again, really looking at that student and you know where they're at and, and what resources do they have and not every high school is, is unfortunately created equal and the things that a student's able to do and whether it's test prep and all that. So we've decided to move away from that. You know, we're looking at not only GPA, but trends in GPA. You know, maybe that student had a rough start, but they've been, you know, on the upswing or we get that letter of recommendation who said their grades aren't reflective of how hard they work and what a great person they are and, you know, all these other things. So we have moved away from that. In the nursing context, it is a big part of the application. Um, process because testing is is such a big part of of a you know a nursing major um, and so that is the only one that we've we've weighted it but everything else is is truly test optional. DCM. Yeah, you so want we do require the SAT yeah. or the ACT. Uh, we don't require subject tests, but students can self-report that on the application if they wish to do so. Um, and for us, but it, everything goes back to context. So it was mentioned earlier. Um, so we're able to look at where the student's coming from and the access to resources that the student had. And if we're able to see that the student is very strong academically speaking, plus they wrote incredible essays, they have community service, they've been really involved. I mean, it's a whole package. You really need to look at everything to make sure that you know the student um, and and their strengths and how they're going to be able to perform at the university. And sometimes, you know, that's not always the case with the test scores being reflective of of their hard work. Um, With that being said, through recommendation letters, we also get to understand and kind of going back to what John was saying, context about um, the area. And, you know, I really appreciate what the counselor says. The in, in our high school or in our district, you know, the average SAT score was this. And so when I'm looking at the student and I'm able to see, wow, where does the student fall? within that district, you know, that's really helpful information for us to calibrate ourselves in the review process. And that's why every applicant is looked at individually. 
within the context of the high school, the region that they attend, uh, where, where they go to school, their um, life circumstances, the resources. And that's why, you know, the job is not a, a formula. It's not, you know, something that's very easy uh, at, at times because you really do have to put yourself in the context of that student and the resources, especially when it comes to standardized testing, at least for us. And standardized testing can be such a, a misguided uh, tool that students use in terms of, and Kathy, you see this, you know, in, in, in your work, they see an SAT score, they see a GPA, they say, I have that, so I will earn admission to all these schools that have a profile of this. And as Cindy was just mentioning, there's so much more that goes into it. The rigor of the curriculum, where there is no measure, there's no discrete number, is a better predictor of student success when they come to our institutions necessarily than just a test score or just a GPA even. But it's a combination of those factors as well as what we're going to glean from those recommendations about grit, determination, work ethic, those types of things also correlate as well. So how do we evaluate that? Test scores are, and for some of us, you know, a factor, but they're not the driving factor. So speaking of the rigor of the classes, yeah. um, what would you guys prefer if a student took, um, say, an English class, a CP class, college prep class, and got an A, or should the student take an honors class and get a C plus or a B minus? What would you prefer? Would you prefer them that they challenge themselves and take that honors class and maybe get a B minus? Or would you prefer seeing a college prep class and have the student get an A? So um, uh, that's a very good question. I think that um, uh, when we, uh, if we, if you were to break things up uh, for us, um, we're looking at um, the curriculum and uh, how well they, they've done within that particular curriculum. Yep. Have they exhausted all the opportunities available at their particular school, yep. right? So that's where um, putting things into context is in terms of the curriculum that is available. Uh, for example, here at Wakefield and, and how they've been able to navigate uh, that curriculum for the four years. Do, have they had the many opportunities and flexibilities uh, to be able to, to push themselves um, so, I mean, we, we typically like to see uh, a strong curriculum. Um, we want to make sure that the student is doing their very best. I think that that uh, letter of recommendation from the, from the guidance counselor and, if, and, and from a particular subject comes into play if they speak uh, to the student's uh, commitment and motivation and tenacity. Um, and, and allows us to, to put each one of those grades into context. We require test scores, uh, and, and the reason for that right now, as, as, as it stands, is because of the rigor within the curriculum that we have at a particular institution. As a business institution, right. uh, business focus, I think that we You're really want to make to sure. take some tough course, oh, tough absolutely. exams when they get out of Bentley. Uh, absolutely. So <laughs> I think it's important for us to see if they have uh, uh, that, that, that level of ability, potential ability. But it's not the all, uh, end, the all end all. Um, I think it's part of the full package. And we are going to evaluate the student with the full package. So we will take a wide range of students. So, and, and like it was said, I, I think that some students zero in on the scores and the GPAs that are provided by colleges and they said, oh, I'm good. I'm good to go. It just doesn't work that way because of the previous comment that I made. Right. Each year is a very unique year. So you're going to have, you're going to go into the process uh, with a set of uh, perhaps goals in mind but you don't know what's gonna transpire after you dive into it. I would say rigor looks different for each and every student, even if they're attending the same school or they're graduating the same class. Um, I think one thing that I always recommend my students to do is to take a moment to reflect on the classes that they've loved and how can they, they can have those conversations with their counselors and their family members about maybe challenging themselves next year and take that class at another level, maybe honors, maybe AP, but really you know, doing the self-reflection, the introspection to take a step back and notice, I really love this class. Maybe next year you know, I can take it at another level or maybe I need some support here. How can I seek that support? And not wait until they're you know, failing the class to ask for that help, for that support. Because as we mentioned earlier, those recommendation letters from teachers who can tell us about their improvement in class and how they were able to seek out, seek out help 
they're equally as, as powerful and as important. So I think being able to create a balanced schedule that works for the student while also keeping in mind, am I taking the classes that I need to take in order to apply to that specific program for that university? And that's mm -hmm. also really important to keep in mind. You know, so for us, for instance, with the Carroll School of Management being a very competitive and selective business school, we need to see calculus on the transcript, mm -hmm. you know, having taken calculus in high school, not the summer after they graduate from high school and not in college. So you know, you want, they want to, you want to put yourself in a good place where you're applying with the required curriculum uh, for the program that you're applying to for that specific university. So doing some kind of research, talking to the counselors, and setting themselves up for success, um, but definitely challenging themselves. Uh, nonetheless, making sure that they're asking for the help they need to be able to do well and, and be happy and be well. And, and we talk a lot about mental wellness and right. balance, oh, you funny. know, and so making sure right. that they are first and foremost taking care of of their mental wellness and well-being um, and that they're making the right choices for themselves, not comparing themselves to others. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, there's a university out there for yes. every single student that, that pursues right. uh, that track. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's all about being able to be a little bit flexible because we already talked about some institutional goals that come up every year that might be different, that might be driving uh, the selection process and how we're shaping the class every year. And so a lot of different variables that go into it. But nonetheless, at the foundation, the student needs to be well, well, happy, uh, pursuing what, what it is that they want to pursue in life because that's going to take them far wherever yes. they go. Is that the same across the board for you guys? Merrimack and BU, yep. Yeah, I, the only thing I would add is I think there's also a misguided notion that the more APs I take, the better off I'm going to be. And there's a, there's a threshold, right? You know, certainly if you have a handful of APs and you're doing well in those, that's great. But we'll see students who will take 10 or 11 or 12 yeah. APs if there are no limits yeah. in the school. Yeah. That can drive the stress level and the anxiety. And as Cindy yeah. mentioned, balance I, is I important. I can tell you as a parent, <laughs> as a parent of, a, of a child who took all APs their senior year, I wasn't sure either of us were going to survive. Uh, it was a really rough year. And I I was got my recommendation for my, my son to do that. Uh, but he was a highly motivated right. student. However, it was still stressful even for, for him. And I would say to parents, please, please don't do that. Well, and for some <laughs> students, that, that may very well be the right decision. Right, yeah. sure. But we don't want students to think that is the pathway to success because right. there is a point of diminishing return. Mm -hmm. And so takes like, to what Cindy said, take the courses that are interesting to you, yes. excel in the areas that you can, and take a balanced program. Are you finding that students are coming to your colleges and universities um, prepared? Are they college ready coming from high schools? Like, are they, do you find that some kids just, they can't set an alarm or, you know, they can't make it to class? You know, like, what, I, what and, is it that you're And saying? what can we do <laughs> as a high school? At, at the high school level to help that? Right. Because you're, you have information we need to help our students be college ready and right. career ready. I think it's really important for both schools and parents to really start empowering their students to take you know, hold, especially of this process um, and this journey of theirs. And, you know, for many students, this part might be their first kind of um, foot into kind of adulthood and that big adult decision making process and transition. And uh, I think sometimes, you know, it be, it's very much a family and a school process. There's so many stakeholders involved. But at the end of the day, I, I really want students to feel empowered to take hold of this process to call the schools if they have a question, you know, do you have my application? Do you have everything you need for me? Um, I have a question about this or a concern and I want to address that. And I think giving students the tools and the, you know, permission to, to go on their own a little bit, I think will make that transition a lot easier for both families, for, you know, the student. Um, I think really making them aware that this is their process to take hold of it, to get excited about it, and that starts to develop those kind of life skills that will really help them when it comes to having to reach out to your professor who you have a question about, or, you know, maybe there's an issue with your roommate and you have to, you know, learn how to address that. Or, you know, when you get into your career field, I think slowly learning these skills is really important. And I think this is a great time for a student to do that in a safe environment where they still have a support system, where they still have that safety net but it allows them to kind of inch a little out on their own. And that's something that I really stress 
to, to families to do and to schools, hopefully continue to promote just empowering the students to really take ownership of this process. And then hopefully that will develop that skill set for them going forward. And I think peer pressure is a big thing too, mm -hmm. that they need to learn how to handle in college. Mm -hmm. uh, something I should have learned when I went to Merrimack. <laughs> <laughs> but um, definitely uh, peer pressure can be tough for kids. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you see that a lot at your level. I think that it's also important for us to uh, reconsider the relationship that we have um, or that, that parents have with their students, with their sons and daughters. And um, I think that being able to set a set of expectations going into the, the process uh, will certainly be healthy. Um, I, I see a lot more of uh, students um, very competent and able to achieve at the, at the next level, but at the same time, uh, struggling uh, emotionally and, and their well-being, so to speak, um, in terms of trying to navigate by themselves uh, this whole journey that you go through, which it should be a very exciting journey, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, the, the most precious four years of your entire life to some, to, to well, some accounts. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I, uh, again, I think that uh, we we want to we want we want to be able to have a student that uh, it's well balanced coming in, uh, not only on the academic side but the personal emotional side, because we want them to certainly enjoy uh, their four years in our institution and take full advantage of all the resources available now, to them. I'm going to ask you that you, you can't be here without me asking about the, the scandal, the, the scandal. But I want to, I, the way I want to present it to you is, I know what it's like being a teacher and all of a sudden on the news, a teacher has done something horrific. And all of a sudden, I'm now put into that pool. I'm all of a sudden, everybody's looking at me like, well, you're one of them. How has it been for you as admission officers presenting yourself now after all of this information has come out. It must have been, you must have been just sitting there shaking your heads going, oh, this is gonna be fun. I mean, how have you been? How has your field been since this has come out? Then I'll jump in at once. <laughs> I think it's, it's been a challenge. I mean, it's been a challenge personally and professionally, certainly. And I think to our staffs as well, making sure that folks still feel good about their work. Because at the end of the day, this wasn't an admission scandal as it's been coined as Varsity Blues. It was more wrongdoing by individuals in different oh, positions and institutions. Yeah. And yes, it, it dealt with this enrollment into selective or highly selective institutions, but it, it, it masks all the amazing work that so many qualified students do, that we interact with, that we go to bat for, that we advocate for. And that reminding our staffs that this is the important work that we've committed our careers to, and that doesn't change. And you know, this, this saga will continue as there is more that unfurls, but I think we can remain confident in the work that we do that is supportive of students and trying to build the communities in our campuses that are gonna help them thrive. Um, I think it has illuminated other things that we can take a critical eye to in the profession as well about equity and justice. And I think there are some things that we all probably have to do some soul searching about as institutions, but those specific things are so far out, uh, out of our control that I think it's trying to empower our staff to continue to make the right decisions for the institution, but also for students. And do you, do you feel that uh, their punishment fit their crimes? Or do you feel, what, what's the shop talk? Because <laughs> that's the water cooler I want to be next to. <laughs> I mean, if you want to take the legal route, uh, I mean, bribery, extortion, you could you could fill in the blank. Uh, it's serious matters and should be taken seriously. And they are being taken seriously. Having said that, I think that there are so many great stories that come out of the work that we've done, that we continue to do, uh, that we have done for so many, many years that in, in my mind, it outweighs um, the, the, 
this situation that we're in right now. Having said that, I, I, I'm not naive to, um, to understand that the, 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 everything is going to be painted with a broad brush and, um, and that you are going to feel like you're part of uh, this uh, scandal as well. Uh, but if we if we are smart enough to contain it to the select a few individuals um, in the grand scheme of things, uh, it seemed like uh, perhaps may may not be that that of a significance. But at the same time, we are in a, in a twenty four seven society that uh, it's going to continue to come out. And um, we are going to be able to 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 see what 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 the final outcome is. Uh, but for us, uh, we feel really good about the work that we do in our particular institution, and that's the only thing that I could certainly control. And uh, our team, it's a very good team. It's a quality team, and we are trying to do what is right by not only the student that it's applying the families, but also the institution and what we need to achieve each year. So um, we're going to continue and we came out and we were shocked mm -hmm. like everybody else. But we came out of that feeling like we could do some continue to do some great, great things. Because ultimately, that is your your yeah. goal is to look at your your school and the diversity of your of your programs and trying to find the best kids for that year Absolutely. and that is ultimately what you want mm -hmm. and the scandal becomes this big versus what you do is this big sure i think just going back to something mario said about some things being out of our control you know at the end of the day we're counselors we're advisors you know we care about the work that we do i know personally um you know i continue to guide my students even after maybe it's not a positive decision getting those emails from them, letting them know, letting me know, thank you for taking the time to respond to an email. Thank you for walking me through my questions that really left an impression on me. That's just something that someone with like a good human being can do, right? It's just right. discerning like what, what kind of actions and impact you want to have on this process and with the students. And, you know, even though some things are out of our control, at least we can be, um, you know, someone that responds to their emails, someone who is present, someone who at least answers their questions and helps them understand that, you know, we're learning with them and we're going through this process together and that we're there to help them and be a resource to answer their questions. Um, but yeah, I think at the end of the day, I mean, everyone, you know, has to discern their, their questions. And, and this instance, very unfortunate. It was also very um, eye-opening. And I hope that families and students will learn from this experience and we can all learn together, you know, as well as counselors, everyone, um, because, you know, hopefully it's, it's not something that we want to see repeating itself again. Right. And to close out the show, um, if each of you could just talk a little bit about your college, maybe trends or new programs happening that you want to talk about. Yeah, so at Merrimack, um, I think the big thing has been growth. Uh, we've been really excited. It's been really exciting to kind of see the school evolve over the past several years. I've been there for seven years now, and it's a very different institution in many ways than when I started, but I think the identity has really maintained in terms of, you know, really highly individualized, personalized attention for students. Um, that's been really important to us, but it's been exciting to grow. You know, adding new programs, I've mentioned nursing, our STEM programs have been growing, which has been exciting, the move to Vision One. So it's never a boring time on campus. Um, I hope, you know, if you like construction, it's a great campus to be on, uh, but it's exciting. It's, you know, a school on the rise. It's exciting to, you know, be on other sides of the country and see a Merrimack t-shirt, which is, you know, I'm not something I'm as used to than maybe the rest of you, but it's been great to, to see the school grow and evolve. Um, but still maintain its identity. Uh, and it's just been, it's been, you know, an amazing, amazing time. And I can't wait to see what the future continues to have. In Money Magazine, recognized Merrimack is one of the top 10 most transformative colleges in the United States. Is that what no. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's, it's, yes. It's been exciting just to see, again, that fit, students who are a great fit, we think have amazing potential and really continuing to work with them so they can really thrive on campus and then go on and do Really incredible stuff. Thank you. 
Cindy? Uh, for us, I already mentioned earlier that we moved away from early action this year, so we introduced early decision one and two into our process. Um, in terms of construction on campus, uh, <laughs> we do have a new institute. Uh, it's called the Schiller Institute for Science and Society, um, and that's going to be the hub for research. It's going to also bring engineering classes to campus, so we're really, really excited about that. Um, but all of the research is going to be interdisciplinary, so a great way for collaboration between the different programs, um, and they all have to focus on some kind of positive social impact that the students and the professors want to address. And then finally, we opened, at uh, the beginning of this year, we opened the new fitness center. So it's a state-of-the-art fitness center. It's beautiful with an Olympic pool, um, a golf simulator, a rock climbing wall. So <laughs> really great. great ways of incorporating wellness into the whole student experience at Boston College. Mario, how about Bentley University? So last year we came out of... Uh... Uh, uh, finalizing the construction and opening of our um, multi-purpose uh, arena uh, where our hockey team, uh, Division One hockey team, uh, it's enjoying uh, calling the, the, uh, the facility home. Um, and uh, that's really exciting. But at the same time, uh, we also have a brand new uh, president. She came from the Ross School of Business at Michigan. And... Um, with that new advent of uh, new leadership, I think that uh, we'll continue to uh, stake our ground uh, as a leading uh, business school in the country. And we're really excited about the outcomes that are taking place on our, on our campus. Um, a great um, thing that we are going through, a process that we're going through uh, these days, is our uh, curriculum uh, redesign. Uh, so we are re redesigning our curriculum and we're really excited to see uh, what comes out of uh, that hard work and, and determination and uh, for the benefit of the students. So um, I, I think we're poised for the next 100 years since we yeah, celebrated 100 like years a couple of years back. Mm -hmm. So really exciting uh, times mm -hmm. on our campus. Thank you. John, yeah, to continue the, the the thread of exciting times and construction, yeah, <laughs> construction. I've seen a lot of it. Yeah, right. you've made your way down Commonwealth Avenue, um, and I think that just a couple of the key projects that have happened, I think, illustrate the the variety of programming and you know who, what types of students could be successful here. Um, we're going to be breaking ground. We've been doing some drilling for a brand new data science center that's going to be going up on Commonwealth Avenue. Just last year, we finished the Booth Theater, a beautiful theater, just a couple of blocks down. We've put a lot into um, our research initiatives with uh, New Life Science Center. Um, so all of that is to say that I think the, the campus is thriving. Uh, we're just coming off a nearly $2 billion campaign and a lot of that has gone into programming, into research. You know, we're an R1 classified research institution, we did over about a half a billion dollars in research last year. So that's a part of the student experience in all disciplines. Um, and how this really plays out for students is we have also rethought our, um, our general education requirement. We have what's called the BU Hub, which is encouraging students to get outside of their disciplines and exposing them to different areas and students who are studying in different areas. And so we really think that this is going to facilitate a lot more um, collaboration and connection across the campus. Uh, so we're excited about the, you know, the next 10 years and beyond, um, but construction is always something that keeps us on our toes. Sounds like it's awesome. across the board. <laughs> I know. It's exciting. No, I <laughs> Great. Well, I want to thank you all for coming thank on the you. show. Thank I know it's so a busy much. time of year for you, thank so you. I do appreciate your time. Thank you for having And us. I want to thank, thank the time. viewers for watching another episode of Talk of the Town. Thank you.